So just to review, when you derive the finite difference equations, there were two different versions, explicit, and what we're really talking about is explicit in time, explicit in time, and that equation looked like this in general for an ith, for the ith grid block, the pressure at time n plus 1 is equal to Eta is this dimensionless constant, the diffusivity coefficient times delta t over delta x squared. Right. So remember uh, what these, the, the superscript here, this is the time at n plus 1, right, and this is the ith grid block. So anybody look up the word explicit in the dictionary? Like, can you tell me a definition of explicit? How about, how about, well obvious is a good one, but you know, maybe to write down plainly. How about that? We accept that definition? to write down plainly. And so the reason we call this explicit is because we, in, we write down plainly in terms of things we already know. So everything on the right-hand side of the equal sign are things that are already computed, right? Because the nth, times, the nth time step was one in the past, right? And so we already know what the pressure is, okay? <laughs> and, and of course, we know the grid blocks are just the spatial this, the spatial discretization, so we, we always know that. So that's sort of, you know, just remember explicit means to write down plainly, and it means everything, to compute the new pressure, you do it with everything you already know for, from old values, okay? Um, we can distribute the eta and rewrite the equation like this. Which sort of starts to lend itself to uh, something like a matrix formulation, right? So uh, one, another way, I'm just going to show you in matrix notation, I might write that this is eta 1 minus 2 eta eta times pi minus 1 pi pi plus 1 all at the nth time step. So that's just sort of a matrix vector notation. So we also had the implicit formulation. And that guy like this. So again, we're going to sort of follow the same notation in that the things we don't know will be on the left. So that all of the p n plus 1s are unknown pressures. They're on the left. 
and the things we know are on the right hand side of the equal sign. So that's sort of the convention we followed up there. It's just now we have an implicit equation. The things we don't know, we have to solve a system of equations to find. We can't write it down plainly. All right. And so what, what then is, uh, since the implicit formulation, we have to solve a system of equations, right? So then what would be the advantage? This is clearly more difficult than the explicit, right? With the explicit, I can just use everything I already know. So then why would I ever use the implicit method? It's unconditionally stable. Right? So the explicit method, it has a conditional stability criterion, namely that eta is less than what? Yeah, one half, okay. And so uh, that, clearly if you look at what a, how eta is defined, that, that, that forces a relationship between any delta t and delta x I can choose, right? And in practice what that means is that it's only stable for very small time steps, really. And so if we want to simulate very long times, we have to take tiny time steps to get there, uh, tiny, uh, to remain stable, okay? And so, you know, the, the difference is that in the explicit method, each computation is very easy, right? The new pressures are calculated with the old ones, so every computation itself is very, very easy, uh, but the cost is that we have to take small time steps for stability. In the implicit method, we can take as large a time steps as we want at the cost of, now it's, we have to solve a set of equations every time step. Right? So that's the, uh, which one is more, yeah. Uh, I can I can go over that last next time. Yeah, it, it's uh, or maybe I, I actually have a sort of short write up on explicit versus implicit methods. Maybe, maybe I'll post it and show you. Uh, it it comes from uh, an basically an, an eigenvalue type stability criterion, uh, and so you know all these differential equations have some solution of the form e to the you know e to the lambda t, right? And as long as the lambda is negative, then it'll, the, the decay, the errors will decay towards, you know, they'll, be, they'll remain bounded. But if it's a positive, then it grows unbounded. And so it's a, that's where it comes from, yeah. But I, I have a little write-up, actually. I can just post and send you the link, and you can read uh, about the two methods. All right. So um, we also have... Boundary conditions, right? Dirichlet. Who likes these names? Who can Dirichlet and Neumann? Can you ever remember? Yeah, me either. There, there's a there's another name for these called essential boundary conditions. Central boundary conditions. And so these are of the form, um, and I think Dr. Bellhoff used the example always at the, in the notes, always at the left side. So the pressure is fixed um, to, or is constant PB, some constant PB at x equal to zero. So at the, in one dimension at the left boundary, right? And um, there's also boundary conditions of the Neumann type. And another name for these are called natural boundary conditions. And the reason I put these here, it might, it might help you. Um, so these are of the form, uh, some flux Q um, minus dp dx is equal to zero. And I think in the notes, Dr. Bauhoff only showed this at the right-hand side, so at x equal to L. Um, one 
if you can, I'll try to help you remember. I don't know if, I don't know if this will help or not, but we'll see. So if you if you can remember essential and natural, which maybe that's not any easier than Deutsch, Dershle and Neumann if you just have to commit it to memory. But the reason they're called essential is that ultimately we're going to form a matrix equation, right? So you'll have like some matrix. Now ultimately, we're going to we're going to form a matrix equation, a x equal to b, right? And you know the the entries of a are going to be r related to these coefficients here, right? Um, well, that matrix a is singular, meaning it has no inverse, right? So the solution to that thing, the solution to this thing is a inverse b, right? Well. It, a is singular, it has no inverse, unless you apply essential boundary conditions. So if you can remember that, they're essential because they're essential to solving the system of equations. Okay? So if you can remember essential, then so essential boundary conditions are of the fixed pressure type, or in, in, the, in that case over there, they would be in the vector x. So you have to have Something in the vector x defined, at least one. You don't have to, you know, just one, to, to make it not singular where you can invert it. Okay, but and so the, they're essentials for the solution of the equation. And then, so the, if I I can always remember essential. And so then the thing is natural is just the other one, and and natural and Neumann both start with an n. And so that's how I remember. Otherwise I. I always have to go through this thing. Well, I, I know for a fact what the essential ones are. Okay, so the natural ones are the other ones, and Neumann and natural go together. Therefore, the other one is Dirichlet. So I, I sort of have to go through this whole process in my head every time. Uh, so anyway, if that helps. Um, of course, in practice, when we um, well, let, let's work. Let's work an example. Or look at an example. 